Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches, where today I'm going to be talking about the romantic drama slash cinematic car crash that is The Room from 2003. And this film centers around Johnny, a banker who lives in San Francisco in a townhouse with his fiancée Lisa. Now, although Johnny showers Lisa with gifts and praise, albeit rather shallow compliments based entirely on her looks, Lisa has become bored and dissatisfied with the relationship. Possibly because, based on the painfully awkward sex scene that more or less starts the film, of the fact that Johnny seems to be making love to her belly button. Lisa is not in a position to simply break things off with Johnny, however. It seems she needs somebody to financially support her. It's not clear what, if anything, she does in terms of a career of her own. So she sets out to seduce Johnny's best friend, Mark, whose principal virtues appear to be his good looks and his proximity. He lives in the same building. Lisa accomplishes Mark's seduction with little difficulty, and although after they first make love, Mark briefly accuses her of ruining everything, apparently he doesn't feel he should share any of the blame for what happened, the two of them are soon sneaking around on the regular to conduct their secret affair. For very limited definitions of sneaking and secret, though, they're not exactly subtle or careful, and it isn't long before almost the only person who doesn't know is the seemingly oblivious Johnny. But it's inevitable that even he will work it out eventually, the only thing that isn't clear is what will happen when he does. So The Room stars and was written, directed, produced, and entirely financed by Tommy Weiser, a man whose personal details, including his age, the source of his wealth, and his background, remain largely unverified, though it is believed he was born in Poland. Wherever Weiser's wealth came from, there was quite a lot of it. He spent a cool six million US dollars on this movie, about 10 million in today's 2024 terms, all of which went on production costs and marketing, the latter of which included a single billboard in Hollywood, which Wiseo paid to keep advertising, advertising the film for a full five years. Now, by most accounts, the actual production of the film was a mess, so much so that it spawned the film The Disaster Artist. Wiseau had no production or directorial experience and indulged in many unnecessary expenses. He bought equipment he didn't need, he built sets for scenes that could have been filmed on location, and he alienated many cast members, leading to multiple roles needing to be recast at the last minute, including the key roles of Lisa and Mark. So with all of that going on, you probably won't be surprised to hear that The Room is a bad film. What you might not be prepared for is how transcendentally, bewilderingly, and compellingly bad it is. So go grab your spoons and we'll dig in. The first most egregious and most obvious of the film's drawbacks is the on-screen presence of Mr. Wiseau himself. None of the cast exactly cover themselves in thespian glory, though, as I'll discuss later, it would have been a truly formidable actor to make some of this dialogue work. But Wiseau's stilted, awkward performance is in a class of its own. Imagine the worst kind of painfully self-conscious and yet obliviously incompetent local dramatic society acting. You're starting to get some idea of his performance. Perhaps the most famous of these, and easily Googleable, is a scene after Johnny learns that Lisa has accused him of hitting her while he was drunk. He heads up to the roof of the building where he bursts into shot while monon monotonically delivering lines. I did not hit her. It's not true. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Now, I've tried to be as true to the original as I could in my delivery there, but I doubt I captured the true awkwardness and I probably sounded too much like a living human being. The thing is, this isn't even a particularly bad piece of dialogue in and of itself. I could easily see somebody falsely accused like this ranting to themselves before abruptly realising someone else was there and shifting to an awkward greeting. I didn't hit her. It's not true. I would never. Awkward pause. Oh, hi, Mark. Now, I'm no actor, not pretending to be one, but I think you get the idea. Like, it's not that the line itself is terrible. It's the delivery. Which is not to say that, you know, non-terrible lines aren't in here because, you know, the more or less coherent or at least explicable nature of that scene is an exception rather than the rule. The room is filled with utterly bizarre scripting moments, such as a conversation between Lisa and her mother, where the old woman announces she has a confirmed breast cancer diagnosis. Lisa responds, oh, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. They're curing lots of people every day. And her mom immediately agrees. Oh, I'm sure it'll be all right. And then changes the subject. The matter of her diagnosis is never brought up again. Now, I've seen fan theories that the cancer diagnosis is a lie, told to get sympathy, much like Lisa's claims about Johnny being violent. 
However, I suspect that in a film with a dozen other abandoned subplots and weird non sequiturs, this is a case of thinking about the scene rather more than the actual writer did. Other examples? Well, there's the scene where the florist doesn't recognise Johnny, but then he takes his sunglasses off, something you, know, you wouldn't think would be that difficult. Uh, and after she removes him, she tells him he's her favourite customer. I mean, sure, maybe she's just buttering him up because he seems to spend a lot of money there. But again, when you have a pattern of incoherency like this, any coherent explanation must be treated with suspicion. Some of the other incoherences, a scene where two friends of Lisa sneak into Johnny's apartment to have sex, and only Lisa's mom seems to find this at all odd. A sequence where four men in black tie attire play football for some reason. And, well, pretty much everything to do with Johnny's much younger neighbour, Denny. Young Denny has a clear fascination with Johnny and Lisa's sex life, flat out asking them fairly early on the movie if he can watch them. Uh, he also apparently has a drug habit, uh, which we will learn in a scene which, you guessed it, will never be referenced again. And finally, there's just the weird way Wiseau writes dialogue in general. Lisa may be Johnny's fiance, but that word is never actually used. Instead, she's always referred to as his future wife. And then there's the recurrent use of the apparently irresistible double dog dare that is calling someone a chicken and then going cheap, 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 cheap at them until they do what you want them to do. Or the fact that every third line out of Johnny's mouth is, don't worry about it. The writing here is astonishingly bad and astonishingly bad in ways you just like, it's like scenes from different movies have been stitched together. Now, I could complain about many other technical elements of this film, the baffling side scenes that go nowhere, the non-sequitur conversations, the terrible green screen effects, the way that one actor and his character completely vanish to replace with a new actor and character that fills in to speak the first guy's dialogue. The fact that, there was, the fact that this was even possible indicates that they filmed this disaster in page order rather than grouping similar scenes together to reduce time and cost. But instead... Let's talk about the sex scenes, because there are four of them in this movie. The first is the longest and most awkward, with Lisa and Johnny engaging in awkward foreplay and even more awkward intercourse. As noted, he appears to be making love to her belly button, um, while bad R&B plays and rain streams down the window. And now, of course, it's not surprising that scene is awkward. If they were filming this page by page, as they appear to have been, then this scene was shot pretty early in the production, giving Juliet Danielle, who was a last-minute choice to play Lisa, very little time at all in which to get comfortable with her co-star or with performing an intimate scene at all. The third sex scene appears to be a, largely a shorter recut of the first, while scenes two and four feature Lisa and Mark. These aren't quite as awkward to watch as the first. Mark at least seems familiar with the location of the relevant anatomy. But they were apparently quite awkward to film. Actor Greg Sestero was so uncomfortable at the scenes uh, that he wore jeans throughout them. Yeah, so at the end of the day, The Room is a mesmerizingly mangled movie. I've seen it four times, most recently, in honor of the 21st anniversary of its release, and I find something new to be bewildered by every time. Next time. The Dungeons and Dragons movie of 2000 was notoriously bad. The Dungeons and Dragons movie of 2023 was actually pretty good, but a financial flop. But in between those two films, independent studio Aristorm Entertainment released the movies I'm actually going to talk about, the five films in the Mythica series. They're not branded as Dungeons and Dragons movies, but if you've ever rolled a 20 side die in anger, it's not hard to see that that's very much what they are. But that is next time. Until then, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you've seen The Room, let me know what you thought of it.